many people on on with us this morning. Um, I guess just having a little break uh, hopefully has just increased uh, interest and you'll know that uh, this is the first of our fall series of three that are really going to focus on notions of recovery. So today we're it's our great pleasure to have Dr. Uh, Sky Barbrick um, and on the 27th on the 30th, pardon me, we will have a session on uh, clinical uh, systems of recovery. And then on the 27th, we will be joined by the Mental Health Commission uh, around recovery-oriented guidelines. So just to give you a sense of upcoming sessions, and that information is posted on this website. So again, a warm welcome, your team. Many of you will have met before. Uh, but just as a reminder, Jordan Clark is our technology support. Matthew is here to my left. Uh, who's obviously, as always, keeping things ticking along beautifully. And then you'll remember Dr. John Higginbottom is really the person who started off this advanced practice, and we're very grateful to him. So that's your little team this morning. And you know that advanced practice is funded by the Ministry of Health and provides leadership education guidance to the mental health field to develop and put effective evidence-based psychosocial rehabilitation practices in place. We are very grateful to our instructors for their support and expertise. Um, and you'll know that um, people who, who do this work with us do it um, for free. So we're very grateful to them for their time and their support. Um, please do review our archive sessions on the website. So if you have an interest um, in some of those past uh, sessions, uh, we hope you find them useful. And as always, if you have uh, a particular topic you're interested in learning more about, please do let us know. Uh, we're keen to really meet your needs, and the more that we hear from you in terms of what you'd like to learn about, uh, the better job we'll do. So, um, uh, yeah, so we'd like to hear from you about about upcoming topics. Um, this just this slide really speaks about advanced practice and our purpose. And as we mentioned, it's really about transferring evidence-based knowledge to practice. Uh, we provided some ex expert clinician consultation uh, to some organizations, providing training and education events such as we're doing today, developing our website resources. So I'll just uh, take your attention to um, our um, annotated bibliography. So for those of you interested in research or those of you thinking about writing a proposal or maybe uh, developing some new programming, you will find the latest annotated bibliography of psychosocial rehabilitation interventions on our website. And we'll hope that that's a useful tool for you. And then our final purpose is to support our provincial advisory committee and really you, our community of PSR practice. So again, if you're interested in, in some new topics or you might even be interested in presenting uh, a topic of interest to you, please do let us know. We'd love to hear from you. And that leads us into our evaluation. Uh, you, after every session, we do ask you for some feedback. Uh, we hope that we're getting better. We hope that the delivery is useful to you and the content's useful to you. And the more feedback we get from you, uh, the better job we'll do. Uh, so thank you all of you for giving us some feedback and please keep it coming because we have much to learn as well. So thank you kindly. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Sky Barabek and you'll notice Sunshine, her dog, who's looking at her very lovingly. Um, but um, beautiful picture, I think you'll agree. But Dr. Sky Barabek is a postdoctoral fellow at the University of British Columbia in the Department of Psychiatry. She's also an occupational therapist with a clinical subspecial interest in how modern med methods of measurement can inform the rehabilitation of adults with serious mental illness. She currently leads the uh, Personal Recovery Outcome Measurement Project in Canada, which aims to understand the recovery needs of Canadians with mental illness. And she'll speak more about that to us today. And so now, and again, a warm welcome. So thank you, Regina. Thank you, Matt, for, for inviting me. Um, I'm going to start by just giving you a little bit of a background about who I am, uh, just to add on to, to Regina's comments. I am an occupational therapist and started my career working in beautiful Kingston, Ontario. I worked on two assertive community treatment teams there. I moved to Montreal to do my PhD studies at McGill. I spent a year and a bit at the Centre for Addictions and Mental Health doing my first postdoctoral fellowship there. And now I am completing another postdoc here at the University of British Columbia in the Department of Psychiatry. 
And I'm also linked up with the Department of Occupational Science and Occupational Therapy and St. Paul's Hospital in Vancouver. So um, the reason I'm giving you that journey is that I've had a really neat opportunity to be able to um, assess recovery and to understand recovery and understand perhaps where the gaps in, in, in services might be or could be improved upon uh, across the country. And uh, recently in the last few months, as you'll see, I've had an opportunity to travel across the country to really learn about what people are doing in different provinces and, and what we could potentially be doing to move uh, recovery forward and to advance psychosocial rehabilitation practices in Canada. So um, it, normally when I set up the, the classroom, it, it's filled with goodies and food and coffee. But what I want to make sure is that uh, you get your virtual coffee and, and we do this together. So the purpose is to give a bunch of slides today and uh, for me to, one sec, I'm having a technical difficulty. Yeah, so we're going to, I want you to be able to make sure you have um, have your coffee, be comfortable, and that we set up an opportunity for discussion. We have people from Whitehorse down all throughout BC, right out to, I believe Toronto is our farthest east I've seen come on, but we have a lot of people from across the country today, so let's use this as an opportunity to, to dialogue. I'll be talking for about an hour um, about how are you measuring recovery, but the, just the title of the, the, the presentation itself is really intended to get you to start thinking about what your approaches are in your practice and uh, if you do research what your approaches are in research. So I'm going to throw a lot at you. The, the resources uh, will be there. Matt Lang will send them to you. Um, I'll jump up virtually uh, up and down to, to stress points of importance that I think we should all be, be coming with in moving forward in this topic. But um, I'll really let it up to you to be able to take the knowledge that you need um, moving forward, whether it's for your clinical practice, for research, for policy, Etc. Um, and before my, I just want to stress also that my contact information is at the end. But I really want this to be an open uh, dialogue in the beginning, and, and I'm available by email if you want to contact me afterwards after the presentation to chat recovery in person or, or virtually. If that's okay. So um, also on this website uh, is oh, some oops, we're make this up here, is uh, the Center for Addictions and Mental Health. And um, a lot of this work that I'm going to be presenting to you today started in Toronto and started with um, the group in, at the Center of Addictions and Mental Health with Juan McKenzie and Sean Kidd. And um, we've moved forward in this last two years. It's been a really great partnership with a lot of people. And so if you've met me in the last year when I've been across the country, you know that I've shown you, shown you my ideas and I've asked for lots of opinions and lots of uh, opportunities for collaboration. So this is a, a great partnership from people across the country and, and now globally, and people from very many different backgrounds, whether it's mental health, psychometrics, et cetera. So the objective today, um, almost 200 of you signed up for this, so it's uh, really to talk about what's out there, what are the current measures of recovery available in the literature, and uh, to talk about what, uh, how some of them are working and how they're fit for purpose for, for your clinical practice or research. Um, again, they signed up for this, that we're going to talk about psychometrics, and I'm going to try and do it in as least of a scary fashion as possible. But uh, we do have some important discussions to have about measurement in mental health, and, and choosing the right uh, assessment tools is very important, not only to inform practice, but to inform discussions about where we're at, where we're going, and how we're going to get there. And then I'm going to just focus on some end, end thoughts to for you to think about how can you use these recovery measures in practice to advance your, your own practice and research, um, but also to think about measurement and recovery and mental health in, in a much more global fashion from a community perspective. And you'll know what I'm talking to about if you uh, make it to the end of this presentation. Um, just note these are the, the four measures that I'm going to focus on, especially today the recovery assessment scale, the questionnaire process of recovery, the illness management recovery scale, and the personal recovery outcome measure. Um, there are lots of them out there. We're going to go a little bit more into detail into these four, um, but I will give you some resources if there's other tools that are fit for purpose for your practice that you would prefer. So a little background on, on mental illness in Canada. I'm preaching to the choir a bit here because you, you might know most of these numbers. But it affects about one in five of us. Um, it results in significant workplace productivity, uh, reduced workplace productivity, and extensive costs to our healthcare system. Um, it is also associated with the probability of living 25 years less than somebody who doesn't have a mental illness. 
I put this in bold, but we're going to go back to the statistic um, later on in the presentation. But the fact that someone's lifespan can be shortened so significantly is often associated with chronic health conditions such as diabetes, obesity, heart ailments, respiratory diseases, a vulnerability to homelessness, unemployment, and alcohol consumption. So this is the first place that I might just stand up and virtually tell you that this is an important statistic and um, one that I think we've slightly ignored a little bit and it's really, really important to think, why are people who are experiencing mental illness, who have a diagnosis of serious mental illness to schizophrenia, why are people dying on average 25 years less than someone without a diagnosis? So before we get into this, presentation in more detail, I want to tell you a story about ketchup-flavored potato chips and cheap cigarettes. And this is a story, I've changed this person's name, have full permission to tell this story, um, about a woman who I worked with early on in my career, and she, at the point of meeting her, um, for today's purpose, we'll call her Joanne. Uh, she was a 38-year-old woman with a diagnosis of schizophrenia. She had uh, been diagnosed at, at age 17 and had been hospitalized at age 19. She had been hospitalized consecutively for 20 years at a hospital. Um, and once the, um, the hospital beds, there was 400 bed hospital and 300 beds were slotted to be closed, she was identified as one of the people that could move to the community. So I went to meet this person and, and went on to the walk toward where she was living um, and said, hi, my name is Guy Barbic, I'm your occupational therapist. I want to talk about moving to the community. Let's set some goals. And she said, Oh, Sky, do I have goals for you? When I get out of here, I want to get cheap smokes and catch a flavor of potato chips. A little tuck shop down the road, they just ridden me off the last 20 years on my expensive smokes, and they won't get catch a flavor of potato chips. I have been asking and begging, and I am jonesing for catch a flavor of potato chips. And she went on asked uh, telling me about this. And of course, as a good occupational therapist, I validated her goals and said those were important to her. Um, but then I tried to nudge her a little bit and said, okay, what does it look like when we're moving in the community? I want, I want to talk about goals about moving into the community. And she became very frustrated with me and very upset and, and very upset for several weeks on end because she wasn't actually feeling like I was listening to her. She just wanted me to bring her cheap cigarettes and her, her, her ketchup flavor potato chips. And um, once, again, I just kept on going and validating her, her, her goals, trying to establish some way of discussion about getting her to think about what it might be like living in the community and outside of the hospital setting. So finally one day I came and she asked about, about uh, if it would it be okay if she told me about another goal that she had. And her goal was to dance. And uh, I asked her about the dancing and she, she wouldn't tell me anything further about it. She asked me to go to call her parents and to give her parents a call. And when I called her parents, um, her parents were very cheerful on the phone and told me that, um, or asked me if she'd ever told anyone else about dancing. And I said, I didn't think so because I had read every single page of her charts, which is about 12 and a half feet tall if you want to stack 20 years worth of charts on top of each other. And I found out that uh, there were, in reading those charts, pretty much that she was a 38-year-old woman diagnosed with schizophrenia at age 17. I've been living there pretty consecutively since she was 19, had one attempt to discharge, and that was about it. And so I didn't know who she was as a person. I didn't know what her goals, her dreams, her aspirations were. So when this dancing thing came out of the blue, and it was a very sensitive topic for her parents, um, I thought, this might be quite an interesting thing. So, so I went to meet uh, Joanne, found out uh, from her parents that she used to be a very elite ballerina who used to dance very competitively at a very high level nationally. And when she fell sick, she never danced again. Um, so we, we went and connected with the dance studio and she danced for about, about two, maybe not even two minutes, a minute and a half. And, uh, when we were dancing, she, she stopped suddenly and she said, Oh my gosh, I am exhausted. I don't know if you saw that, but I gotta quit smoking. Like, this is just ridiculous. I am out of shape, Sky. Like, I used to be a really good dancer. I know what to do. I don't know. Can you help me quit smoking? You, you know, I might have to learn to lose some weight too. I need to, I need to lose some weight. Can you teach me how to eat healthy and where do we buy groceries? And I'm thinking, you know, I'm thinking about this apartment you want me to move to. And I think maybe I need a long apartment so I can put some mirrors up. And I'm thinking that I'm going to need some lessons. So I might need a job. And I think, can you help me get a job? So the person who I've been struggling for weeks with, who had no goals, um, all of a sudden had 50 or 60 goals and really starting to think about what her, her life might look like as a dancer in the community. So the reason I tell this story 
is that this person um, was discharged within about two months from the hospital and um, with support from her sort of treatment team, um, with initiative or with the goal-driven um, by her goals, she very quickly moved to the community, learned a lot about living in the danced, established a community of support around dance, um, was able to get a part-time job as a dance teacher, essentially, and uh, really thrived. And this, this is a story I've told for a while, but this is about eight years later, and this person is still never returned to the hospital. And so the reason I tell you the story is that at that point, I was a junior occupational therapist, and I wanted to really start asking these questions about what on earth did I do, not really knowing anything other than my basic clinical training was, to help this person who had been hospitalized for 20 years move forward. And at the time, I was privileged to have been trained by Dr. Cherry Krupa and, and be part of this new recovery um, movement that was really getting started in Ontario um, in the early 2000s, and people were very excited about it. So I was trying to ask the questions early on. What tools did I have uh, to promote recovery? Did I, how did I know they work and, and how can I evaluate their effectiveness over time? And so it started getting to me to think about the ruler. And the ruler is what you'll see throughout the rest of this presentation. Um, I'm going to bring it out this way and I'm going to bring it out um, in, on the screen. So what I want you to start thinking about is this ruler. And if we talk about low recovery on the left end of the ruler at zero and the high end of the ruler the ruler is high recovery or, or optimal recovery. Um, you should think about where this person was at in her recovery and, and why was she stuck at that one, two, three centimeters for so long? And how did she move forward so so quickly? What level of support did she have? And then how could we actually quantitatively capture that and say, hey, this is, this actually this actually worked. What we were doing was working and we're promoting recovery as a health service and we're doing it driven by a client's goals, which is really cool. So it got me starting also to think about, well, what do I actually measure in mental health? How can I show that Joanne is moving up and down the ruler? And the things that we measure are hope and empowerment and quality of life. These are all things that we can't put on a bathroom scale to measure how many pounds hope is or how many empowerments weight, uh, in terms of weight that empowerment is. Um, we also measure lots of other things in terms of cognitive abilities and apathy, depression, pain, locus of control, readiness for training. And so we do this and have this clinical assessment and we try to get this total score that comes out of these, these often patient reported outcome measures or rating scales. And the rating scale usually generates a total score. And from this total score, we're asked to communicate to our clients or our patients um, what that total score means. We're asked to communicate what that total score means across our team discipline, uh, our interdisciplinary team members so that we're talking the same language. We're asked to communicate that to family members, perhaps for policy making, for management, etc. So understanding what that total score means is really important. It's, it's intended as a, as a discussion that we can have about where a person is at, where they, where they are going, and how they're going to get there. Or it could be at where a system's at, if you're evaluating your own system on recovery, for example, um, where your system's at and providing recovery services, where they're going, and how they're going to get there. So we're going to focus a lot on that today. And of course, we're going to do it with recovery. And so recovery is now uh, the single most targeted outcome for individual, program, and systemic level in Canada Mental Health Services. Um, whether or not different provinces would use different words, but basically the same philosophy and model of care is really about moving people towards living full and meaningful lives um, despite having a mental illness. Um, it is the now mental health strategy and, and guiding outcome for many countries across the world. The yeah, government of Qatar just released their mental health strategy with recovery as its primary outcome. And so if it's this guiding vision of service and it's this guiding strategy to capture what we're all trying to move towards. Perform. So we are um, at some point going to have to acknowledge uh, what we're doing and, and what we're trying to do and how we're moving people forward. And so recently when the Mental Health Commission of Canada released its recovery guidelines, um, I, I was able to count the number of times that we were talking in those guidelines about moving towards recovery or trying to achieve recovery, promote recovery, enable recovery. 
And um, and the guy, the commission was really nice about supporting uh, my question and perhaps a bit of tongue in cheek and saying, what the heck are we moving towards? How do we know we got there? And how do we know that someone like uh, Joanne, who's stuck two or three centimeters, is moving forward? And how do we know our system's supporting that? And clearly, I'm preaching to the choir. The people who signed up today for the PSR conference know about recovery, and they feel like they're doing it. Um, and we've all struggled with actually saying and showing the evidence of how we're moving that forward. So I think I'm just going to be posing some possibilities about, about how to address that um, in, in the future. So just so we're all grounded on, on the same definition, um, the, the concept of interest we're talking about is personal recovery. It's living the satisfying, hopeful, and contributing life, even with the limitations caused by illness. Apologies for the, the formatting error on this slide. But it is William Anthony's definition that many of us use, and the idea that somebody is moving beyond um, just having the illness define who they are and moving towards having an illness be a small part of who they are and reestablish a sense of self of who they are in terms of roles, uh, being a family member, uh, somebody who works, for example, somebody who has peers, but really that the illness is a small part of who, who we are. So we've talked about um, a little bit of a background. Now we're just going to get right into the current measures of personal recovery available. Um, and then we'll move forward on the other fun psychometric stuff. That That's why I know you all actually really signed up for this. But <laughs> it's, it's, good, it's, it's going to be fun, I promise you. So how can you measure recovery? Came up with this question in 2012. I started my own systematic review. And then um, two groups came up with <laughs> they published it right away. So it was great. And I feel like I haven't had to. Uh, do the whole process of the systematic review. So I'm going to sh just um, highlight their two articles, which you can find um, and dig up yourself. And, and Matt will send you the links to those articles. But um, and then I'll also give you a little bit of an update of what's happened since this time of 2013. So this is uh, by Marissa Schuyler and, and Larry Davidson's group about looking at their their um, summary of measures. They found they summarized 12 in a lot of detail. And then the very same month, um, Mike Slade's group, uh, led by Vicki Shanks, they published the measures of personal recovery as well. Um, so they highlight collectively um, 18 measures of, of recovery. They do a beautiful job um, summarizing the, the uh, properties of the tool and the psychometrics properties of the tool. Um, and now, so what I've done and what I've provided and that will send to you is um, a summary of those measures that they included in their assessments but also a few extra ones that have been published recently. And um, this is a worksheet that you can feel free to use. Um, and it is established really as a, as a tool to get you to start thinking about measurement um, and about what first am I actually trying to measure? What is, that, what is it that I'm trying to measure? And just simply giving people questionnaires to fill out assessments and getting a total score leads you to sometimes forget about what we're actually measuring. What are we doing? Um, what's the context of use that you're measuring in? And so what's the setting? Who are the, who's the population you're trying to measure? Uh, changes on age, culture, etc. And why is this important um, is that I think in, in rehabilitation and actually in health across the board, we have a little bit of a disability in, in saying that a tool is reliable and, and valid without actually thinking about what that means. So if you may be jumping up and down is my first for jumping up and down. If a tool is actually reliable and valid, it needs to be fit for purpose to assess change in your context of use. So often some of these um, measures were developed in very different contexts of use of what you might be working in. So to really be aware of what, uh, what uh, context was that developed in and tested in, and would that actually apply to the group that I work with or the group that I am um, trying to show change on. And then why the heck am I trying to measure this, this outcome? So are you measuring to show uh, change in your, in your clinical outcomes? Um, if you're doing that and you want to have an annual assessment, for example, of, of recovery changes uh, of, of your team that you're servicing, for example, on a sort of community treatment team, or are you actually measuring to directly inform practice and to inform how things are, are moving forward? And so there's different, different purposes for why people measure outcomes. And, and some people just need data to show the big bosses what the data looks like. Um, but many of us as clinicians need the data to actually inform a discussion about how people are, are doing, um, what their strengths are, and what their weaknesses are, and how we can move forward together. So there's lots of uh, examples that you provided in this, this handout. 
And um, I've provided a, a summary of the, the metrics of how strong the metrics are of these tools, as well as the ease of use. Um, and then I just encourage you to really look at the, some of the details and go dig up these references and, and find out how, how they were developed and find out, does this actually apply to the context of use in which I am working for, uh, or working in? And is it fit for purpose to measure change in this population? So I work right now um, with a group of youth and, and trying to assess youth. And there are very few examples of, of measures that have been developed with youth um, that can show change in youth, and specifically for, for youth with, um, who are marginalized and uh, suffer from um, addictions problems and, and have a mental illness as well. So it's a very uh, complex picture of outcomes that I'm trying to measure, such as quality of life and recovery in this group. And it's very important that I have items that can inform change and that are meaningful to the, this population as well. So in moving forward, there's two questions that, um, that I ask you as clinicians, researchers, um, or individuals who might be assessing their own recovery to think about. And so the first thing is, what are you trying to do? Are you measuring a recovery profile, this global picture about what people are, are what, what's, what recovery looks like either in your institution, what it might look like at an individual level, at a group level? Um, and we're going to talk about that. And then we're also going to talk about, are you actually trying to measure recovery? And, and measuring recovery means something very different than having a profile of recovery. So we're going to move uh, and talk about those two areas in about the next 10 minutes. So recovery measures that are out there, um, like I said, we, there's, there, there are several. You have examples of them. Um, they are mostly patient-reported outcomes uh, or rating scales. And the definition of that is a scale in which a person fills out or can have uh, assistance to be filled out. But these are, this is outcomes or topics or questions or things we can't weigh. We can't use our, our, um, our measure, our ruler, to actually measure out exactly how much or how many pounds recovery is. These are questionnaires that we give people that we have all filled in questionnaires. Um, and they're intended to have this total score that then informs some kind of discussion at the clinical level, individually, across teams, policy, etc. So let's talk about some of the evidence supporting the measures that, that we have. Um, and then I'm going to talk specifically about the study that, that I'm looking at. And, um, and then we'll talk about if, the, if they're, they're fit for purpose for your practice, I'd love to open up the discussion about what that might look like later on. And, um, and then I'm going to introduce you to the, the personal recovery outcome measure itself. So this is the, the PROM project that I lead. It's the um, personal recovery outcome measure project. It's a bit of a, a spoof from the psychometric world. Uh, the big topic in psychometrics right now in health outcomes research is patient reported outcome measures. So it's the PROM of PROMs, and the global uh, objective of the PROM project is to assess the recovery needs of Canadians with serious mental illness who specifically receive community outpatient mental health services. So that is my area of interest, uh, but recently we've actually moved into the inpatient setting and I'm just going to start collecting data in an inpatient setting. So let's sort of change this now. It's just to assess the personal needs of Canadians with serious mental illness. Um, so our specific objectives are really to see, hey, can we, can we assess recovery? Can we actually do it using patient reported outcomes? Um, can we do this? And, and a lot of people said we couldn't, and, and so I'm happy to, to put that as our first objective, to say, can people actually fill these questions in and give us meaningful information about what the needs are um, in, in each community? The second objective of the project is, is to give you this profile, to give you this big picture, uh, of the Canadian outpatient sample, and now, of course, we're branching into inpatient samples, and then to measure the extent to which we're actually measuring what we want to measure, and, and how do the existing scales, are they fit for purpose for our Canadian setting, how well are they doing at measuring the full range of recovery that we're interested in. So this is what um, our, our little Canadian map looks like right now. We have uh, four sites uh, up and running, or starting starting Montreal will start soon. Um, and then we have our, our Winnipeg site that will hopefully get up and running in the middle of October. And we have uh, our site going in Vancouver, where my arrows aren't working, and then Toronto is, is, has been um, completed. So a lot of the data that I'm going to show you are, are from Toronto, 
and um, we'll summarize what's what's happened there, what that profile looks like, and uh, I'll give you a brief glimpse into the Vancouver data because I have some of that coming in, and um, and then we'll we'll tell the story about what else is happening. We also have um, interest in a lot of other places in Canada right now, uh, including Victoria and Halifax. And um, and it's just a bit of a trick and pony show right now, running a run, one woman show to get the, these all up and running. So this is another area of, of seeing the feasibility of, of doing more of this type of research at different sites, especially I know there's a few of you up north, I'm very interested in up north, um, and, and to try and get as much information about what the rehabilitation recovery needs are of Canadians. And of course the goal is that if we know about what those needs are, we can direct services towards that and, and to match um, the, the level of service and promote psychosocial rehab across the country if, if those needs are actually indeed um, highlighting that we, we need to move in that direction. So um, starting with Toronto, the first part of this project was a single uh, cross-sectional survey of 228 people and we asked them to fill in three commonly used questionnaires about personal recovery and we also asked them to fill in three other questionnaires about hope, mastery, and um, mood status. And uh, those of you who are not from Toronto, it's, the, it's a very large city right now. It gets larger every time I go back. But um, this is a public service announcement. There's now a train from the airport to downtown, which is fabulous. Um, and that just changed my life in visiting Toronto. So and we, we had six sites that were participating in this, this study. Um, right from the east to the west and, and a site up north and we also had two sites downtown one which was specific called the learning program and they were uh, youth who were participating so we'd recognized at one point we didn't have youth participating so uh, we had uh, on average group that was about 45 years old uh, split between men and women um, and about 60 percent of people had schizophrenia 25 percent depression Really cool uh, from from Toronto specifically was that we had um, 41 different countries of birth represented in a sample of 228 people. So a very very neat group of folks uh, that we were able to meet and interview um, in that time. So we gave them these recovery measures. We gave them specifically the top three measures that were um, that are cited in the literature, um, including the recovery assessment scale, the illness management recovery scale, and I'm going to make a little exception for the questionnaire of process of recovery. It was uh, it's mostly cited in Europe, um, not overall mostly cited, but it's really commonly being cited in Europe right now. And we wanted to throw this one in to see how well it was working. So the question about feasibility, uh, can people fill it out in the community, was a, a ridiculous logistic one. But we had to we had to actually put it in because so many people were were saying that it wasn't possible to even get the study going. Um, so we had 224 out of 228 people complete all of the questions so we had full data for for almost uh, the whole whole group um, and it took people on average to fill in these 10 questionnaires um, 10 to 30 minutes to complete we randomly uh, assigned different sites the opportunity to to fill it out themselves we gave them the package themselves to fill it and we also um, had a site that randomized to have a research assistant fill in the questions with the person if they volunteered to participate and in both cases uh, either group was not different in any level demographically, nor were they different in their recovery scores. But the group that filled it out their own were actually the group um, that had the complete data set. So the ones that didn't complete the questionnaires were the ones that had the recovery uh, assistant with them, the research assistant with them. So uh, let's tell you about what they, I'm going to give you the profile, so the general, general gist of what it looked like um, before we tell you about how well those measures were working. So in order to do this, um, I've struggled to find a framework that, that works best, but I think this one is working um, really nicely for, for this study and, and is guiding me fairly well at this time. Um, looking at Mike, Ch uh, Mike Slade's group and, uh, from the UK, they have this CHIME framework. And the CHIME framework stands for connectedness, hope and optimism, um, identity, meaning and purpose, and empowerment. So you have uh, these five major areas. So we're talking about this profile, this general um, collective description of what recovery might look like in this sample. And I'm going to give you just a couple of glimpses of, of each of these areas. And we have the paper right now um, in revision. So hopefully it's out soon. And I could perhaps uh, send the link through Matt when it is published. But 
here are just some examples of, of the highlights of this, this project and these results. Um, we had various items that we mapped to the China framework to make sure we were getting um, ideas about what each of the, the areas, how well each of the areas were covered and what it looked like in terms of a profile. And in the blue and the yellow, people who strongly agreed, agreed in yellow to the following questions. I have a purpose in life. I have a desire to succeed. I have an idea of who I want to become. I'm hopeful. And you can see, on average, these are folks who were diagnosed um, majority with schizophrenia. They had been, uh, they're 45 years old age. So people who have been living a long time with a serious mental illness, um, living in the community, and most people feel very optimistic that, that things are going to go well. Um, they have a desire to succeed in a strong purpose in life. As an occupational therapist, these are areas that I was very interested in in terms of the people who had goals in life they felt like they wanted to reach. For sincere, most people, there's a bit of gray here, felt that they could accomplish their goals. Um, and 85% of the sample want to work, wanted to work. This is a brief glimpse of, of Vancouver and looking at this, and, and you can see this is our, our folks living in the downtown east side in, in Vancouver. Um, and uh, the blue and yellow are not as prominent. There's a lot more gray in, in this picture of people who, who feel they have a purpose in life, who are driven by goals and believe in themselves, hopeful, etc. cetera. Um, so this is a group of people who 92% um, report using, um, using some form of drug or alcohol on a regular basis. Um, most live in single room occupancy hotels, uh, which are small dwellings um, in the downtown east side of Vancouver, which are, are not optimal housing arrangements for most, or most would report not optimal, but some definitely say that they're satisfied with their living arrangements. So what you see, our, um, our Toronto sample was very broad and diverse across the city of, of 6 million people, um, and Vancouver's downtown east side is concentrated pretty much in a three by three block radius. So this is a tight, tight, tight uh, look at this group. But we have uh, more data hopefully coming soon from across Metro Vancouver. And um, so we'll see what that looks like in comparison to this group. Going back to the Toronto sample, when you say, okay, these, these individuals are very sick and anyone else who's worked with us, they're, they're, they're too sick to move on and what's to promote recovery, it's impossible. We've all heard that if you're, if you're in the business. Um, and these are questions that we ask people in the last week. How often did you feel like you enjoyed life, were happy, were hopeful? And what you see is almost this reverse profile that um, most people reported that every day they're enjoying life, feeling happy, they're hopeful. And less than a day is our blue bar. And on this side, you see that few people on average were, were feeling like they were depressed, lonely, and fearful. On average, it was a picture of, of positive health. We also asked people about their symptom distress and, and how much it was bothering them. And then this is a horrible slide, and I always mean to change it, but I haven't. Um, these are people that say that their symptoms bothered them quite a lot, so about 20%, uh, quite a bit, and then somewhat is red and green. And then you have people that say it's very little or not at all. So the symptoms are there, but often uh, people are reporting that they're not bothering them too badly. Um, and, and that sort of lent us to the next question of saying, well, what about progress towards goals, do you have goals? And for the people who said that they had had goals, um, we asked them, how far have you made towards accomplishing these goals in the last three months? So what have you done in the last three months to accomplish these goals? And um, we had a little group say, oh yeah, well I have a goal, not really a goal. <laughs> and so that was the no goal group. People said, no, I've done a lot. Some people said it a little way. A, a good group of people said they have come pretty far in accomplishing their goal in the last three months and a small group that said that they'd finished. And we asked these groups specifically, the last, um, the last two, what uh, were they actually doing and what were the goals they were accomplishing? And um, the top four answers were, I cut back smoking by one or two smokes a week. Um, I, I cleaned my apartment. I built a resume. Uh, I attended a day program or some type of program, such as an employment program. So those are the types of goals that, that we'd found in the Toronto sample that were being discussed. So this is the point of jumping up and down that I'll ask you just to pay attention and then you can turn it off if you want and go have your real coffee. But I think this is the, the, the message that I ideally like folks to take home. And there's a really interesting psychometric thing coming up, so hang in there. But it is actually exciting. But this is what I want to take a pause, 
nod, like nudge your partner beside you who's sort of sleeping and, and wake them up on this one. So here we asked a group of people, uh, how much time did you spend in structured, meaningful activity? How much time did you spend doing things that you liked? And when you're developing a question, you want to have it as clear and as simple as possible and not loaded. And on purpose, we actually loaded this question. We gave examples. How much time did you spend working, volunteering, spending time with your family? Um, and we, we had a list of uh, 20 different examples. And so we're kind of going against the grain of what you should be doing psychometrically. But we did say, how much time do you spend in structured meaningful activity? And give examples of things you might do in structured meaningful activity. This included going to appointments. On the bottom um, are the number of hours per week that people reported doing structured meaningful activity. So in this sample, what we had is we had 80% of the people reporting doing less than 15 hours of structured meaningful activity a week. 40% reported doing less than two hours of structured meaningful activity a week. So if you got up this morning, you had breakfast, you made your kids lunch, you got them to school, you came back and you sat at your door, you went to work and you sat at your desk, that is about two hours, that's how long it takes me, that's about two hours of structured meaningful activity a week. And uh, this is an early look at Vancouver and we're finding the same thing, same exact profile looking at that. So two hours of structured meaningful activity a week and I want to bring this back to the slide I told you we're going to come back to um, of revisiting a mental illness in Canada. And we know that the bold sign that I said that people with mental illness, on average, uh, serious mental illness, have a probability of living 25 years less than people without a mental illness, serious mental illness, or diagnosis of a serious mental illness. This group is dying of high rates of chronic illnesses, such as diabetes, obesity, heart illness, respiratory diseases. This group is dying as a vulnerability to homelessness, homelessness, unemployment, and alcohol consumption. My argument is that people with mental illness aren't dying because they have an impairment at the level of their brain. They're perhaps dying a lot earlier because we don't have a system to support people to thrive in the community. They are in the community, but people are not thriving and participating in the community. And when you do very little activity, you are at a higher risk of obtaining all these diseases, such as diabetes, heart disease, obesity. When you are bored and you have nothing to do and you have very little structure um, in your life, perhaps um, you are at risk of homelessness, unemployment, uh, engaging in activities such as alcohol and drug use. Um, the relationships that you participate in are often uh, at risk. And so the conversations we are having with people across the country is really about what is going on? What are people doing in the community? We have a system of support that has promoted people to live in the community. We're moving people out of the hospital and we're letting them live in the community, which is great, it's wonderful. Um, we have new programs such as the At Home Chez Soi, uh, wonderful study that says housing first, get folks in the community. But we have a significant portion of our, our Canadian population who have a diagnosis of mental illness who are at risk of living such a shortened lifespan. And the cost of this to our system, we have to start reflecting on, on what is actually going on here. Is it, a, is it because they have an impairment at the level of their brain, um, or is it that we have a system or the community that, that doesn't promote inclusion and, and people moving forward? So this is um, the one area that I can stress again that is really, really important. So what? Who cares? Uh, you know, we'll, we could say that. But we need to think about that and say we need to capture, we need to start capturing that data and capturing what that could look like in forms of moving services forward and getting PSR to be a primary model of care to, to move um, mental health support um, in, across the country to promote recovery. So what I want to look at is, is how do you do that? And so how do we actually use um, the recovery model to, to, to promote what we know works well, um, to promote individuals living and thriving in the community? And what about the existing scales that we have? So here's your, um, here's your introduction to modern psychometrics. And um, it's going to take me about five minutes to walk you through a few things. And then we're going to look at uh, how well the most commonly cited tools are using. And then I'm going to introduce you to the PROM. So um, here are the measures, again, the QPR, the RAS, and the IMR. And I just want to make sure that Regina you unplugged my computer. Oh, no, it's okay. It's okay. We're, just, we're good. I think we're good. Yeah. Um, so, so what is measurement is, is what we're going to start talking about. 
So I, I raised the point that we talk about what's, you know, something's reliable and valid and we talk about it all the time. Um, and people also talk about what is measurement and, and they say, yeah, yeah, I measured it. I measured it or I assessed it. Um, step back and think about as a clinician or as, as a person with lived experience or as a family member, what does that actually mean? What does measurement mean? And as a health system, I think we've, we've pulled a little bit apart about what that means. So this is a, a man by the name of Jack Stenner. He is at the University of North Carolina. And um, I'm, I'm proud to say I slightly, I like to follow him wherever he goes in terms of conferences. He works in the field of education, but he is someone that I'm just inspired with who talks about latent constructs, things we can't put on a bathroom scale. And he specifically looks at reading ability and math ability for, for kids. So you can't put reading ability on a bathroom scale and say your kid's working at 800 Lexiles or whatever it be. And he's actually really tried to think about these constructs of reading ability and math ability um, in a way of that makes sense on a ruler. i bring back my ruler here. Um, so, so Jack tells a story about measurement. He says, what, if you're truly measuring something, you're talking about what it means to move up and down on a scale for a variable of interest. He talks about what it means, for example, on a thermometer, when you see a thermometer going up and down, you know what it's going from 10 degrees Celsius to 20 degrees Celsius. We can sort of see and visualize what it looks like when that temperature reading is going up the thermometer. Or perhaps you just look on your iPhone now, but I hopefully we all still know what a standard thermometer looks like. <laughs> So um, the, the interesting thing is, is that Jack and I talk about often, or I try to learn from him, is saying, how do you actually think about the ordering of these items that we, we measure things in in health? Um, is there actually a story to these, these, these items? Can we actually visually interpret what's happening um, as someone moves up and down a ruler or a thermometer or whatever you want to picture in your, in your, um, in your head? So in, in rehab... Um, this is more for, for not, not many of you are probably doing range of motions for the OTs in the room. Um, but, you know, there's some things that we have as tools that are very objective. We can measure range of motion and speed and endurance and weight. Um, these are things that are objective. We can take a uh, test. We put them on a, we have tools that can, can measure change, and we're fairly confident with these tools. Um, when it comes to latent outcomes, so these are things that we can't see, uh, things like function, quality of life, depression, pain, self-efficacy, we require the individual to give feedback about these, these um, areas of interest. We, we use items to inform this global picture of what's happening. So again, we have really good tools for objective outcomes, but how on earth do we measure these patient-reported outcomes or client-reported outcomes? So one thing is that we can't see them, so that's a challenge. We can't actually see quality of life. Um, and it's also um, the second challenge is Likert scales. And these are examples of your Likert scale, or you have your strongly agree to strongly disagree. And one thing that we have with these Likert scales is we have a bunch of items, and then we ask people to check in a box. And we assume that every item is weighted the exact same, and then we add this total score. We also assume that each item is a measure. It's a ruler. It's the exact same ruler, that the distance between here and here is the same, here and here is the same, here and here is the same. And I'm going to uh, give you an example, a concrete example, if this, is, if this is scaring you for psychometric purposes. But basically, um, what we do is we get this total score. You've all done it. Um, and we've, we've all taken some kind of survey or something on Facebook to evaluate you know, what Disney character you are. And there's some total score that they give you and give you your matching Disney character. This is a measure of depression, the CESD, the Center for Epidemiologic Studies Depression Scale. This is their measure of depression, and uh, you get your total score. And assuming that all those items are working the exact same and have the exact same distance between all those response options. Um, so you put on this total score, your ruler from low to high. The, the concept of interest we're measuring here is depression, low depression to high depression. And you get in all those numbers, and you're getting that total score. And here I just want to show this is the actual analysis that we look at showing that if you want it to be weighted exactly the same, each of those items is exactly the same ruler that it's using, our ruler is actually very different from each of those items. This is not the same distance from here to here as this, this is your distance from here to here is the red. And so each of the items is very different and the ones with the stars are completely backwards and the items aren't actually working as intended that people are confused about this item response. And this is actually an example of a scale that has some quantification on it 
had the one days, one to two days, three to four days, anchoring people, and people are still getting confused with this. Um, when you start to ask people questions that have strongly agree to strongly disagree response to sales, um, people's judgment about what that means really, really is jeopardizing the, the total score that you get because your strongly agree might be very different than my strongly agree, um, and so on. So the, the, the slide I like to use for this is that we have to think about when we're using total scores to inform recovery. Total scores. Um, and you're adding up items that are asking different things with different profiles of recovery. Does it get to the point that you're actually adding up items that don't necessarily need to be added up together? That they're giving you perhaps a very nice individual level, but the total score might be an example of the sign uh, from New Guyama, where you have your population, your feet above, sea, feet above sea level, and the year that the town was established. Um, these are three very important numbers for this town, uh, but, but the total score is, is near ridiculous and doesn't mean very much. So, so to think about first thing when you're actually adding up these recovery scales, what does that look like and how well is that total score informing um, change in practice? Does it make sense? So if we treat these ordinal scales like a ruler, and we assume that the ruler is the same for each and every item, we run into a bit of, pra bit of trouble. But this is really how we're trained. All the literature, it summarizes these total scores. We're used to seeing our means and our standard errors or standard deviations um, pre and post treatment without thinking about what's the story of measurement? How do they get to that total score? If you're measuring depression, 35 different measures are out there for you to choose from. Um, and, and we're not really sure if that story is the same across the board. So here's our, our modern psychometric slide. Let's skip it. And that's why I'm going to tell you to skip it for honor. We'll just go back to it for a second, actually, because I put some effort into this one. But there's the ruler. When I, and, and when I give this talk, uh, if you've had, seen me in person, I, I walk around with a lot of rulers. And if your kids haven't been able to buy them this year, because uh, I've robbed staples from most of them across the country, I apologize. But um, if there's one thing uh, in your clinical practice and you can invest 65 cents in, it's this ruler. And, uh, and I'll give you a free one if you meet with me. But I think, I think uh, this could be a very, very interesting thing to start thinking about outcome measurement and recovery. And if we're telling the story that, that Jack Stanner tells about, about what it means to go from low to high on a concept of interest, recovery, for example, we have to start thinking about ordering of items and what's the journey how do people get there? The example uh, I, I first do is, is mobility. So if we're assessing someone's mobility, um, and the uh, sometimes we use the SF36, there's certain things that are break down. The person might be starting by just standing up, for example, after a hip surgery. Um, they might be working towards walking a few steps, and then they might be working towards walking a block and walking a mile. And depending where you live, your block might be a mile, but let's just assume a block is about, about 200 meters. So you can see as a person increases their ability in mobility, um, the items are getting more difficult. So if a person falls on this end of the ruler, if their total score is here, we're working as a clinician and intervening at the level of supporting this person to be walking a few steps. If we are thinking about uh, the person here, they're walking a mile, we're most unlikely helping them at this level. It'd be silly to offer interventions at this level where that person is at. We want to direct services to where the person is at on the ruler. So as the person's ability and, and their mobility increases, um, the item difficulty gets more gets gets harder. So it's, conversely, if they're scoring here, there's no point of even asking questions about standing up. If they're walking a mile, we assume that they can stand up. So I want you to take two seconds to, to briefly consider um, running a marathon and I'd like to ask you to be my coach and to think about what that might look like. So a marathon is reportedly 42.2 kilometers. It is a few runs around state <laughs> four times around that part. It's a daunting process but I'm, I'm reaching a new age in my life where I'm starting to set these milestone goals and this is one of them. So I'm going to tell you, though, that I'm right at the beginning of the ruler. And so if our, our ruler is on this screen and we have the worst possible running capacity uh, at zero centimeters, that's where I'm at. And I want to get to 30 centimeters, which is marathon. And if I had the most precise ruler with all the most information, you can 
imagine that that ruler at the top end of the ruler would be the Boston Marathon, which is apparently the best marathon out there. You have to qualify for it to be fast. And that, so now we have um, some folks starting starting to, to contribute, but there's those people that say, where, where do I start? Where, where are we going to start running and training me? And really the first first effort is to to get me out of, of the house or the office and getting me to start running one kilometer, let's say. So if you're my coach and you're training me running that one kilometer, maybe the next goal is two kilometers. Maybe we're moving up to five kilometers once I do that. But only tell me to go out and run five kilometers because there's probably to hurt myself or not not quite ready. And you don't want to discourage me and make me make me frustrated. Maybe I can run the 5K and the next goal is 10K. And then 10K is 20K. And again, if I'm doing 20K and you're my coach, you're not going to say, hey, Sky, just go run a 1K today. We're actually going to be targeting the training at where that person is at. It's going to keep on going until I can get up to this 42 kilometers and until I can actually run that marathon. And so what is interesting is that you, as my coach, will know where I'm at on the ruler, where I'm at on the spectrum, and ideally deliver the services or so deliver your training uh, to where I'm at. So here's this example. As, as, as the items get going up the ruler, as they get harder, um, my ability, hopefully, ideally, in my dreams, is that I'll be able to run these and uh, to be able to meet these areas on the ruler. So if I'm at 12, this is where I'm at. Your training is guided towards where I'm at. And um, we're not we're not at this point. So your coaching is directed at where you're at on the ruler. So let's go back to think, think about uh, and recovery. And um, sorry, some of these slides haven't haven't transferred over, over so nicely, but they should be all A B C D E F. And up a med recovery. What ideally we'd like to have is a story about what does it look like to move up and down the recovery spectrum. What are the items? that we match um, to a person's ability and how do you direct a person's out on the recovery ruler. So here's Miss Joanne who was stuck at that two centimeters for a while and what actual questions could we have used to promote her uh, moving up the recovery ruler and how come she was stuck there and, and how come she was stuck in that at that point of the ruler very long. So this is uh, what we did. We used a, a technique called rash measurement theory to guide this analysis about looking at existing measures of recovery and how well they're, they're answering that question. Um, the first one is the recovery assessment scale that is freely available online. It was available online. I think now to, to sell your soul by giving them email and contact information, uh, but usually very easily, easily accessible. It has uh, 41 items, and here is our Likert scale, strongly disagree, agree, not sure, agree, strongly agree. And um, what we have here is the story of, of the recovery assessments. You probably can't see it right now. Let's just walk through it very, very slowly. So here's our ruler of recovery. We have low and high, so it's on this side at the zero to one. High recovery is up here. With our pink bars, in our Toronto sample, what we have is we have the distribution of people and their recovery scores uh, from low to high. So these are the people, uh, very low recovery, and these are the people whose total score falls in the area of higher recovery. In, um, in psychometrics, or if you've taken any statistics class, um, we ideally look for a distribution that we want to see. We want to see a sample of people that fall from minus three to plus three, and we want to see that, and that represents about 99% of the sample. And uh, the ideal normal distribution that, that we're looking at. So we have uh, in this group fairly good representative from minus three to about 1.5. Now, if we flip over, and what this is is actually is the story of the, so the item low recovery, these are the items that are capturing high recovery. And what we have in this sense from a low to high recovery spectrum is we have a ruler that is precise, very, very, very clear for that middle group from minus one to plus one. But at the low end and the high end is actually not very clear and is not giving us a nice story about what's happening. And at the end, you can see there's very few people up here on the top end of recovery, but theoretically, we're not even asking questions that are that are promoting recovery or even end of recovery. So it's it to see few people, but also a few items. So for a system of health, 
that's going from low recovery to high, how do we actually have items that we can measure that move people up that scale? So there's a gap there. This is just a reference slide. This is the normal distribution. So this is my minus three to plus three. Dig up your old stats books if you'd like, but uh, that, that's just for you. Now the interesting thing with rash method, methods is that we can also get the story of the items. So this is the, the RAS. Um, sorry, it says RSA, but that's just a, a, a entry error. error. Whoops. Um, and so what we have here is the easiest items. This is your running kilometer marathon items. Um, it's important to have fun, have healthy habits. If I keep trying, I'll continue to get better. And if you go up, I've, um, I've selected just a few of them, I think, here. But at the top, you have um, items. I'm just going to make sure. Sorry, yeah, at the top, I'll this up for you of the ruler, you have more difficult items, such as if I have an idea of who I want to become, I continue to have new interests, and being able to work is important to me. And you can kind of picture, if you were talking with any client um, about recovery, that you might want to go a little bit farther beyond that and start asking questions about what that looks like uh, working or what that looks like integrating new interests in the community. We did the same thing with the illness management recovery scale and found a very similar, similar pattern. Uh, actually, this one, there's less items, and it had less of a distribution of the people. Um, and then the items were actually matched to the people, so, so that's good. But we have less of an idea of what the full story is of recovery. And again, the ruler is a little bit foggy if we're really trying to figure out what this, this whole spectrum of recovery is like. Um, the story is really neat, though. The story of the things about using medications effectively. Here's our one or two kilometer realizations. And then uh, we move forward into talking about actually establishing some self-management plan um, and then moving towards pro, uh, personal goals. And then here's that item that I highlighted, time and structured roles. And this is the, the hardest item uh, on this measure. It's the hardest item that we ask people about. Um, or that this is on, on this measure, this is their, their 42 kilometer item. So spending time in structured and meaningful activity is, is the most difficult item. So again, again, if you're leaving and you don't want to leave with any information about, about psychometrics, just and you want to measure recovery and you don't want to pick any of these scales, pick this item. This is the item that is from the IMR about structured meaningful activity and is a very powerful item to highlight what folks are doing. And so imagine if you can actually show uh, what people are doing and how that changes based on an intervention or care or, or in involvement with services. Um, and then you ask people how satisfied they are with that level of, of time and structured roles. That's a really cool metric of recovery and it speaks to a lot of different less awesome. Uh, so this is the questionnaire process of recovery. Uh, this is 22 items and their they're, they're matching of the blue to red is uh, very, much nicer uh, from minus two to about three, and then their items are actually covering it. So that's an example of a ruler that you can see is a lot more clear. Um, I've blurred it, but it's not that that horribly blurry. And their their items are in a very nice order about motivation, um, about moving towards feeling like like you have a purpose, all the way up to this very interesting question: I feel part of society rather than isolated. So you can see if you're changing your objective is to move to that end of the ruler and you're trying to help people not just get into the community but thrive to have people feel part of society rather than isolated. Um, what a cool outcome that is for your health service to be striving towards. So what I encourage people to do is take this ruler, um, sit down with your team, say here's high health people to be healthy recovery. What is the journey in which we're supporting people to move up that ruler? Um, I don't know if I'm going this way or whatever it is for you guys, how you can see me. But in order to move up towards that 30 centimeter ruler, what is the journey that we're, we're trying to support people to, to move forward in? And how can we have this discussion with people about uh, here's where you're at, here's where you're going, and here's where it can get. And so the QPR does actually give you an interesting discussion to start having dialogue with people at the top end of the ruler. Even if you're at the bottom end of the ruler and you're, you're just trying to get motivated to get better, we can still say, hey, this is where we're going, and this is maybe how we're going to get there, and this is the, of these items, and very, very interesting. So you can sort of walk through this later on and go through these items and say, that's kind of a story. But we did actually, said, I'm not sure if the story, especially on the RAS, um, was because of the blurry parts of the ruler, 
not sure if we, we had ever gone about anyone had done this and saying, what if we ask people with lived experience to tell us what that story is and what can they, can they walk up the ruler and indicate what's happening on this recovery journey? Um, and then if I show people blurry spots, could I get more clarification about what we're potentially missing in measuring recovery? So any of you in qualitative research, your heart might skip a beat here because this is not the best approach to qualitative research, or perhaps different. Let's just call it different. Um, and what we did is we put a bunch of rulers up on the walls, and we had blurry, blurry rulers and, and low recovery and high recovery. And we looked at the existing measures, and we matched items that we knew were working very well. And we also asked people to fill in the gaps and said, what does it look like here? Um, what does it look like at the high end? And what are we really missing in measuring recovery? Um, from that product was, was a new set of items uh, that collectively are called the Personal Recovery Outcome Measure. Um, this paper is, is, in, is in review right now. It, uh, I've been able to give Matt the, the working document of, of the English version of the PROM. We have the French version almost ready up to go too, so if you'd like the French version, you can send it to me or send me a request. Now this is a set of 30 items that has collectively come from our understanding of how existing measures work and how new measures, um, or how, how people filled in those gaps of the, the story. And this is intended as, a, and, and because it's, I led this project, I have no, you don't need to use this as your primary outcome measure, but I want to give you an example of how this one's just a little bit different. And because we, we approach this with the ruler in our mind, how somebody goes from low to high on the ruler. Um, and I know in everyone's head right now is to say everyone's journey of recovery is different and everyone is very different and thing, different things are different to different people, which absolutely we knew about going into here. But the interesting thing is that we um, collectively have tested this now over on 800 people um, across the country and we're finding that the story is holding very similar. So what we're testing is not only how well the, the items are working and how reliable and valid they are, what we're testing is the ordering of the items, the ordering from low to high. So here's our ruler, and it's a 30, there's 30 items, not to, not to, uh, it was done on purpose to try and get to our 30 centimeter ruler. And um, at the beginning, these items are about motivation, about being, having hope, about feeling safe, um, sleeping well. And so you can imagine if, if somebody's scoring uh, at this point of the ruler and they're not feeling safe, we're not going to be trying to drive people towards, um, very intense marathon high-level training, we're going to be really working on that level at where that person's out on the ruler and safety is an issue. We need to work on it. So um, the level of the questions, there's 30 items. They're, they're developed with a strong theoretical uh, review of the literature and assessment of current measures of recovery and those qualitative focus groups with folks. Um, and they go all the way up to the top end, which is this is your top 30 centimeter ruler. So these, um, we keep calibrating these items so that we're trying to get them to fit at the different levels of centimeters so that they are relatively even. Um, and uh, that the goal is looking at the top end of the ruler is about people wanting to be respected by others, feeling like they contribute to their community, spending the days that they do things they enjoy, having control over one's life, being satisfied with intimate relationships, and having peace of mind. And you can imagine that um, folks are... In general, that's what we all strive towards, and, and I think that's important to stress that we all strive towards that, and that's how the ruler has been developed. So the scoring instructions, I can send those two to Matt, but it's, you add up this total score, you divide by four, and um, you get your adjusted score at where you're at on the ruler. So if somebody was at uh, 16, for example, you actually go back to question 16, and you start talking around plus or three questions around that, so from question 13 to question 19. And the purpose is that you deliver services, you're the coach and you're delivering services to where that person is at on the recovery ruler. Um, if somebody is at you know, the safety issue, that's where we're delivering it. But if somebody, this is very interesting, is at the top end of the ruler, I think this might be actually where, where we have to be more creative in our services and start to think about how do we actually promote our services to enable people to feel part of the community, to thrive in the community and to have control over their lives and be fully autonomous and have peace of mind. And so when you're developing your, your services, this is very important. Um, psychometrically, we're really, really happy with uh, how well this is working. It's the items are matching the people. Um, this is 298. This is our, our, our Vancouver sample. It's working really well uh, with folks in two different cities right now in two completely different settings. 
Um, and it's really interesting that the ordering of the items is holding for most adults is the same. The only difference is that youth have a few different items that aren't in the same order. Um, one is, for example, sleeping well is apparently not as important to youth at the beginning. Um, it's, it's important later on. And, um, and, and if you're a young person, you'll know exactly that that, that probably holds. So the order is, is the same for most adults, but when you get to kids, sleeping is a different story. Another thing, just to quickly highlight, is that we don't have strongly agree to strongly disagree. Each item is anchored on time, so 0% of the time, 25, 50, 75, or 100% of the time. Uh, we all operate on a 24-hour clock, and the goal is that we actually have some kind of common metric of, of evaluation for each of these items. So I showed you that mixed up thing, and, and this is said, uh, we can skip through this quickly, but basically the items are working as intended, and the time scale is working as a ruler. And that's very exciting because your total score can actually inform where a person's at, where they're going, and how they're going to get there. So how can you measure recovery? Uh, I've given you a bunch of tools that are out there. You need to look at what you're wanting to measure, uh, looking at who you're measuring it for, and making sure that you select an item that, or select a scale that actually is fit for purpose for your service. Um, the best tool that's fit for purpose is not one that is quote unquote reliable and valid. It's one that was tested for your population uh, that you're trying to show change on. And then the idea is that ideally it tells a story. We have a total score and we can inform where people are at, where they're going, and how they're going to get there. And with Joanne, if we had asked her question about her goals at the beginning um, and set a plan about trying to thrive and move towards services that were encouraging community citizenship and, and full integration in the community, not just being in the community, but being a part of the community, perhaps there would have been a very different story. So we need assessment tools that can inform, um, inform discussions with clients, just have that, that conversation um, that is meaningful. And um, we have the conversation that is where across disciplines with psychiatry and, and other health care professionals. Um, and we need to have conversations with families and policymakers and, and promoting this idea of recovery. But I feel unless we have some metrics to show that um, people are moving forward, the cause can sometimes get a little bit lost. And so now that we have available tools and there's more coming out every day, um, I just encourage you to actually look at them and, and really think about the possibility of using uh, this type of data to match the quality of data uh, of examples that you might have in your own practice to support the idea that this um, patient-centered or client-centered strength-focused model is actually supporting individuals uh, to move forward and have stronger discussions about um, how to orient services around this recovery model. So my vision for the future is that we turn into these excellent coaches and that we, I, I'm using the example of, of as a healthcare professional right now, that um, in psychosocial rehab, we often don't have accountability for certain outcomes. So, so as long as someone's in the community, that's okay. And I think we need to push ourselves to say that we're there to support individuals um, achieve recovery. And, and if that looks like just keeping somebody uh, living in a house, substandard housing environment, doing very little in their lives, then we're actually really missing the, the potential risk that is associated with, with that approach to care. So my vision to, to the future is really about trying to gather some data about time use and participation and recovery, trying to advocate for people to move full and meaningful lives, not just saying that we're recovery-oriented clinicians, but we're evidence-based recovery-oriented clinicians. Um, and then if you're a person with lived experience or a family member, that we can have the evidence that we can support this, this approach to care that seems like it makes sense to most of us who, who work in the field. Clearly, I know I'm preaching, preaching the choir to the choir here, but this is, this is a, a model that makes sense to us. If we can have the numbers that support it, how cool would that be moving forward? So um, I'm going to finish off by just summarizing uh, that we all know Google knows everything. And uh, if we ask Google what physical health is, um, they're going to give you some nice pictures of uh, Google image. Sorry, click on the images button. You're going to get pictures of strength, uh, resilience. You get people that are young and old exercising. They're eating healthy. Brain health is even in here. Um, these are the pictures from a couple of months ago. They might have changed, but the assumption is that they've stayed the same. People are doing exercise in groups and activities, so we really know what physical health is. If you change the word physical to mental, this is what comes up on Google. It's pictures of depression, despair, chaotic thinking, uh, loneliness, very much in isolation in all of these pictures. And um, 
if you think about it as a society, have we even really ever thought about what it is to have mental health? And we need to really start thinking about what is mental health for us all. And reestablishing this definition of what mental health is might be important in any of our services to say, what are we thriving towards? If we're health services, what are we doing? Are we crisis services? Because if you're a crisis service, you only provide a few centimeters of care. And that's a very important service to have in our community. But if we have health services, which there are many great health services across the country, what is it that we're trying to work up towards? What are we trying to promote? And someone like Joanne, how did she get stuck on that ruler for so long? How could we have directed services or offered potential services that allow people the possibility to move up to the top end? So it's not an easy question, what is mental health? Take your ruler, buy it, bring it to your team. We asked this question to, um, to 75 of the experts across the world that are conducting research in the area of mental health and rehabilitation and psychosocial rehab. Um, and we had 75 different answers about what this definition is. Um, very, very confusing, confusing study to do and to pick apart. But if you feel bored, get out another cup of tea and read this. Um, but it, it really is just stressing that we don't know what that ruler is and we need to think about it very, very carefully. But what that means for us as a community, as a society, and what are we trying to direct our services towards? Those of you who are in um, uh, service provision assessment and program evaluation, uh, assessing whether your, your service is recovery oriented is another thing that we are encouraged to do. Um, this is a study that I did with, with Larry Davidson and colleagues and Marie O'Connell from Yale uh, and Kwame and Sean from CAMH. And, and we really found that this too was a service, uh, a paper, uh, an assessment that might need some, some um, further improvement upon. And you can read that and it's, a, it's a, another, maybe that one needs a glass of wine to read that one. Um, this one doesn't need a glass of wine. This is a great article. Uh, and, and read this one is about citizenship and recovery and how to measure that as well. And, and that's a really cool little way of thinking um, from that group. So I'm here for a few minutes to answer questions. Um, we have uh, two ways of contacting me. There's my email. I just set up this new website to try and get the prom off it. Um, it's not up there yet, but it soon will be. So you can kind of check in there once in a while. And um, but the email is the best way, way to contact me, and I welcome any conversation from here on forward um, to, to talk about assessment of recovery. If you're doing something that's exciting and it's working really well, cool, I want to know about it. Uh, I want to share it with the world. <laughs> Let, let's, let's chat about it. But there are some really neat things that are happening across this country, um, and we need to start talking a common language and, and maybe perhaps assessing with a common language so that we can move recovery services uh, forward. And this vision that we all know is possible, we just uh, need a little bit more, more meat to the, to, the, to the overall picture. And, and I think that meat might be a little bit more quantification of this, this great philosophy uh, of care that we're talking about. So I thank you, and uh, I wish everybody luck in their pursuit of recovery across the country and beyond. Thank you. Yay. <laughs> Um, thanks so much, Dr. Barbic. That was an amazing presentation. Um, we do have a few questions that were coming in through the session, and, and we, we just asked folks to hold them to the end, but I collected them, so if you got a couple minutes. Yep. Um, so Sharon asks, um, she was complimenting you on being very much to the point in regards to um, what really needs to happen for people more than opening doors and seeing them occasionally is, is the providing direct support in terms of time usage. So uh, that's, a, that's a comment. Michael uh, asks a detail-oriented question. He says, what tool did you use in measuring time use for structured activity, um, and how was structured activity defined? OK, so um, I, I highlighted the tool. Am I allowed to go back on this presentation? Mm -hmm. I'll just, or, yeah, I can. I just don't want to be that. Can I see all the slides, Matt, or is it? So click your little. Um, oh, yeah, that one. Yeah. I got it. Um, so the time use thing, let's just go to that first, is um, is it? Yeah, so it's item five in the illness management response scale. I'm sorry I didn't uh, clarify that. So this is the, the one, and, and I told you when, when you develop an item, you'll see on the prom, very, very simple, clear, and each item's asking only about one thing. Um, this is a loaded question, and, and initially I didn't like it, but I'm really happy we asked it because it's a loaded question that gives people lots of opportunity about what um, time and structured roles might look like. Um, and if you look at it, uh, you know, we're talking about parenting, working, volunteering, uh, taking care of your apartment or someone else's apartment. These are all types of things that, um, that are 
are possible for time and use. And so we still got majority of our folks saying uh, less than two hours of structured activity a week. So that's how we did time use. I try to think about how, and I've had a conversation with Kim User when he came to uh, Vancouver for the PSR Canada conference. Uh, about how to do this and um, you know there's opportunities Terry Krupa uses time use logs mm -hmm. um, to, to, to do that and uh, it, it, it's very effective and, and, and you get a really neat picture about what folks are doing. Um, the part that I like to add on to this is how satisfied people are with this level of time use because some people are totally cool doing, doing very little um, and then some people are very unsatisfied and then also asking people how important it is to move people forward and so to the clinicians, I encourage you to ask those two questions along with this. Tom? It's a very interesting follow-up comment, and maybe you can address it a little bit for us, uh, Dr. Barbic, from Jay Slade. So regarding this item specifically, it's very clear that it's geared towards performance and, and um, mm -hmm. responsibility to or for others, mm -hmm. rather than structured time for the self. And is there any comment on that? It, it, just the very fact that you're asking that question is brilliant because how often do we even ask people that in, in, in care and in PSR the, or in services and recovery or in services um, and in taking care of oneself often becomes uh, an exercise or a full-time job of attending appointments and attending mm -hmm. appointments that are related to illness management versus wellness management. And so uh, it's a great point. It's something we need to, to talk about more about defining what that concept of interest is. And, and I think here asking a question about, about wellness and about uh, opportunity for doing self-management self um, and, and having your own time. So we, we, may, we might have to blow this topic up and have it as a whole area of research. Um, we're just, you know, we started with this recovery idea and then this is the one item that just blew, blew our minds and saying, what's going on here? Um, and then really putting it together with the actual profile of what the health outcomes are of uh, this group in general is saying this might be something that is clearly associated and, and we need to flesh it out more. I'm going to say it's still new, but let's let's not forget about this little item because it's it's waking me up and <laughs> I hope it wakes some folks up. So um, loud cheering from Penticton. Yeah. <laughs> um, I Sue, hear you. Sue Carr asks um, whether um, there's a space to address response burden on the people who are being assessed. Mm -hmm. in the in the sense that it may impact which tool is most appropriate for use so the um the prom prom really carefully considered that and so the prom is um is is only 30 items but it's also designed uh with the coaching in mind so if people start filling in zeros on the first few questions the assumption is that they're not going to be filling up fours on the top questions and you can actually stop and then we encourage in the instructions that people stop where someone's filled in two zeros in a row and start having a conversation. And so that is a burden, a response burden that uh, to take into that consideration. Um, having clear questions, having questions that aren't ambiguous, having questions that are important and developed by people um, with lived experience that have, have been in, in, the, in the system uh, and understand what's important, that was very important. So the questions that we have in the prom are designed with that in mind, with the, the trying to get clear 30 questions, but also getting people to stop filling it out when um, we're at that point, the ruler that we need to just work on where we're at. And, and so that's 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 one of the things. The, the RAS is, is a great tool for a bigger profile. Um, I'm worried that it's not asking the questions at the higher end of the spectrum right now, uh, but it, it does, you know, it's 41 items and it's long. Um, the IMR really is a quick and easy easy tool to put together, but the questions are, are often, um, and the way we see it, are, are about adding lots of different areas and knowledge base and uh, knowledge of symptoms and, and family support, and each item is very informative. So again, I don't encourage you to look at the total score on that one, but look at the individual items and how uh, they can inform a discussion and care. So burden is all is all about, you know, if we don't collect the data, um, that if we don't ask the questions, we can't deliver care towards that. So, so perhaps we have to do it in two sessions. But the intention of assessment is to drive services. And if you're only assessing to put something in a chart for three years, then you're wasting the, the patient's time, you're wasting your time, and you're wasting healthcare dollars using that to do that. You assess to drive services and to ensure care is at the point where services are, are needed. And um, it's a much more health cost-effective way, I believe, of doing things and an approach to doing things, especially for assessment. So that's that okay? Yeah, 
That wasn't right. a very good Mar Miss America <laughs> I feel like I would have failed that one. But yeah, assess the injury. And there you go. We've got uh, a couple suggestions for going back to uh, structured activity and time use. Um, Victor suggests um, using RAP profiles as uh, a, a great activity log. And Gisela Toyer, uh, in working in clubhouse programs, time usage, um, some folks at Fraser have just started using a 24-hour wheel called a day in my life, which yeah. starts the discussion on time usage and is found to be okay. quite useful. Um, we've got a really great question regarding um, usage of the tool and monitoring over time. Um, so Natasha Absol asks, how often do you recommend repeating the measurement given that different individuals will progress at different paces? Absolutely. Great question. Uh, I'm just going to go back to your meaningful wheel. Um, I, one thing that Jeff Mass, who's an occupational therapist in Vancouver, uh, in the inner city youth team is doing, and I think it's really is, is getting people to fill in the wheel, and then he gets them to highlight the activities that are meaningful to them as well. So you get the idea, but you also get the, the meaningful things. So that's kind of cool. I thought that was a neat little thing he's doing, mm -hmm. so I wanted to share I didn't get his permission, but I'm sure he wouldn't mind. Um, the next question, sorry, is repetition of repetition the tool of the for tool. monitoring the I just had a great discussion with the Wellington Center in Montreal about this. Um, you need to ask that question, why are you measuring? And so if you are measuring um, to have some kind of program evaluation annually, then that's why you're measuring. But if you're measuring to inform care, you need to, my opinion is you need to have this as a story about what's happening. And so um, you can assess monthly, you can assess every three months, whatever it is, but unless you keep having a tool to anchor people and why we measured and what we're trying to work on, that's a, a bit of a struggle. So with the prom, I encourage people to fill it out, to fill it out with a client and their ruler. <laughs> if, they, if they have a ruler, give it to their client. Give them a copy of the prom and, and X where we're at on the ruler and say, this is where we're at right now. This is where we're working at. And the next time I see you, whether you're on an ACT team and you see them every day, um, we're going to talk maybe once a week where we're at in the ruler. And we're also going to talk about where we're going. <laughs> and so uh, and if I see another treatment plan that's been put in a chart that's 15 years old or we're still working on that treatment plan, um, again, it's not a cost-effective or very clinically uh, evidence-based way of doing things. But if you're going back to that assessment point uh, as often as you can, uh, that is fantastic. And it means you're, you're talking about this is where we're at, this is where we're going, this is how you get there. And an interesting thing to do uh, as well is, is to reflect on the services that you're providing. So there was some person that's telling me that they couldn't get their client past seven centimeters because all they wanted to do is, is talk about um, this pet, and this pet that they, they very much couldn't have this pet, and it was, it was a, bit, a bit extreme. And one of the, the things that provided that clinician some information was, you know what, I don't know how to get that person beyond talking about this, this imaginary pet that they can't have. And all we do is talk about it for hours and hours and hours on end for a week for about seven months, and we're not moving forward. And she identified that she needed a bit of help in, in talking about motivational um, interviewing and talking about ways and different strategies to help this person move forward. Um, and that was really neat because she used it as her own tool to anchor, hey, I've been working with this client, I've been stuck at seven centimeters for a long time, and, and we're struggling in our relationship. So it was all not only her saying, oh, he's not moving at seven, he's stuck because he's too ill. It's about saying, maybe we need to offer some different services to help that person move forward. And, and when you talk to the top end of the ruler of this person, of course they want to become um, full community. They want to contribute to their community and, and want to live a full and meaningful life. Um, but just wasn't quite there yet. And, and, was, and she identified her own need for further training or for further support from her team. So kind of cool. So anchoring it in, um, if you want to do it monthly, I encourage, I encourage it monthly, but I encourage it constantly to have a discussion about where you're at, where you're going, and have a plan to how to get there together. That's client-driven, of course. Okay, well, I think we have one, one more question that's coming in, but I think it's still being worked on, so we might be able to address it offline. But in respect to people's time, we're supposed to be ending today at noon, so I think we will do that, and maybe um, Dr. Casey can close us off. Can I say one quick thing for that can. last, just for things? Uh, at the Center for Addictions and Mental Health, uh, we're establishing a portico link to have a, a national, because it's the national strategy to capture recovery. So people hopefully will soon be able to log into that uh, and, and to be able to get their own recovery profile and then also to bring that back to their clinicians. And cool. so teams are encouraged to do that. 
But for now, if you're interested in collecting this data um, and, and you want to share it and you want information right back uh, right away about whether it's fit for purpose for your practice, uh, I'm collecting it, a uh, bit of, again, the, the trick and pony show uh, of seeing what's happening and, and in helping out folks uh, get their best approach to care. So, so nationally, we should have an approach soon. Um, and I'll, I'll maybe just forward that along to you, Matt, and you can share it with the group. So very exciting times. Sorry, Regina. Go no, ahead. no, no, no. That's very important information. So it is my great pleasure to say thank you to, I believe, 144 people who are online today. So my goodness, we're just thrilled uh, to have that number. And we know why, because um, the work that Dr. Barbrick is doing is compelling and exciting and I think really helpful in terms of trying to move the recovery agenda forward. So we're really appreciative to have her in this city and to uh, really benefit from her wonderful expertise. So thank you to you. Thank you to Dr. Barbaric. Thank you to dear Matthew as always. And we look forward to seeing you back here on the 30th um, um, yeah, for our next session, which will speak to a clinical recovery system. So that is a particular recovery approach that uh, Fraser Health are using. And so we will learn more about that next time. So thanks kindly for being students and